19 today, but let's go. Lord, I'm thankful for the words of the song that we just sang, reminding us that, um, that we're here because of your mercy and that, um, yeah, we can approach you not because of our character or our um, good things that we do, but because of your character, because you invite us to draw near to you. So um, yeah, I pray that as we look at how the Israelites were invited to draw near to you in a covenant relationship, that we would also be able to see ourselves in the story and um, hear what you're inviting us to Pray that you would speak to us this morning through your word and help us to have open hearts to listen. Same, amen. Um, this is an update about our lives. <laughs> we got chickens. There's Farmer Andrew. Um, get from the chicken coop. <laughs> we got these chickens for free from this really fancy house in Gahanna. They we're getting rid of them for um, unknown reasons. They <laughs> 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 was like all of their food and <laughs> ate little chicks and yeah. So these are now in our backyard and hopefully we'll have eggs like in a couple months. <laughs> So anyway, that has nothing to do with Exodus 19, but <laughs> <laughs> I would show you guys chicken. Um, so I feel like maybe it's just because I was gone last week, but I feel like um, I need like to be reminded of where we are in the Exodus story. So um, Yahweh has freed the people from slavery in Egypt. Um, and they followed Yahweh's pillar of fire and pillar of cloud out into the desert, right? And then there were three tests. They um, had a water test and then a bread test and another water test. And um, they approached those tests with varying degrees of success, right? Um, and we talked about that for the last couple of weeks. And then last week, John um, talked about the battle against Amalek. And then in chapters, that was the end of chapter 17 when they fought Amalek at a place called Rephidim. And then in chapter 18, which I'm shamelessly skipping today, <laughs> Moses's father-in-law, Jethro, who you might remember from the beginning of Exodus, comes and visits him where the Israelites are camped out in the desert and gives Moses some advice about delegating authority to other people so that Moses doesn't get burned out. And um, Moses takes that advice, and um, it seems like God has used Jethro to speak to Moses in that passage. So feel free to go read chapter 18 for yourself. There's lots of sermons on it out there. Most of them are like business advice. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> no comment on whether or not that actually is what the story is about. But um, yeah, so we're going to skip chapter 18 and we're going to go straight to chapter 19. And chapters 19, 19 through 24 is, um, takes place at the foot of Mount Sinai. So Israel arrives at Sinai and they're going to receive the terms of the covenant with Yahweh. And so I want to talk a little bit about just the structure of these chapters before I get started. Um, because I think it's a little confusing. There's lots of narrative. So Moses goes up the mountain, Moses goes down the mountain. He actually goes up and down seven times in these chapters. And then Yahweh speaks to Moses. Moses speaks to Yahweh. Moses tells the people what Yahweh said. The people respond. Moses goes back up and talks to Yahweh. It's, so it's, and then interspersed is these big chunks of laws. That we got the Ten Commandments in this section, and then also these 42 laws that are together called the Book of the Covenant, or the Scroll of the Covenant. So it kind of jumps around from narrative to law, um, and then back again, and so um, it's kind of like this big mishmash. And so when I was first reading through these chapters, I just kind of got really like, okay, what's going on? Where are we in the story? Why are we now talking about all these random laws? So um, I, I listen to some podcasts where different scholars um, were talking about the structure of these chapters, and it's actually a chiasm. Surprise, surprise. So 
if you remember, a chiasm is kind of like it um, builds up to a point and then comes back down and the things on each side match. So the, we have in chapter 19, we have the introduction to the covenant and that's kind of a block of narrative. And then chapters 20 verses 1 to 17, we have the Ten Commandments, which is the first chunk of laws. The God, Yahweh is telling them the terms of the covenant, right? And then in the middle, we have another block of narrative in chapter 20 verses 18 to 21. And um, I'm going to call that the test, and we're going to come back to that later on this morning. And then there's another block of laws, the scroll of the covenant, or the book of the covenant. And then we get another block of narrative at chapter 24 where they ratify the covenant. So that's kind of the big overarching structure of 19 through 24. And we're going to be in these chapters for the next few weeks. So um, this guy called Tim Mackey, you may have heard of um, from the Bible Project, and other scholars think that this little chunk of narrative hidden in the middle of the chiasm is actually like out of chronological order and it's kind of a flashback to um, chapter 19 or like a retelling of something that happens in chapter 19. So um, I think that's pretty, I think that makes sense and we'll talk about why um, later on. All right, so we're gonna um, just jump into chapter 19 and I'm gonna kind of read um, sections of the chapter and make some comments. And we're gonna focus mainly on the first six verses of chapter 19. And then we're gonna kind of breeze through the second half so that we know what happens. So, all right. So verse one, Israel is arriving at Sinai. It says on the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim, that's where they fought Amalek. It came into the wilderness of Sinai and they encamped in the wilderness. So in verse one, there's this time marker. It says the third new moon. So if you remember when they left Egypt on the night of Passover, Yahweh told them this is now going to be the start of your year. So that was like the first month. And then now it's the start of the third month since they left Egypt. So it seems like the narrator is using this to show that a new phase of the story is starting, right? So the Israelites are here at the foot of Mount Sinai and they're gonna stay here until Numbers chapter 10, verse 10. So all the way through the rest of Exodus, all the way through Leviticus, and then to the chapter 10 of Numbers, we're gonna be camped out at the base of Mount Sinai. <laughs> and that's actually, if you're interested, that's about one sixth of the entire Old Testament narrative books. So like Genesis to Kings, takes place, one sixth of that takes place at Mount Sinai. And that's uh, 59 chapters of stuff. <laughs> so it kind of seems like, like compare that to the first 11 chapters of Genesis that covers like thousands of years. So clearly what happens here at Sinai is really important to um, the identity of Yahweh's people, right? Um, just by the sheer volume of material that's devoted. Sinai. All right, so verse three says, there Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God and Yahweh called to him out of the mountain and said, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. So Yahweh calls the people the house of Jacob. Um, and that's, that's I, I think we haven't seen that phrase for a while. They're mostly called like the Israelites and the people of Israel. So why would he call them the house of Jacob? Let's uh, remember back to Genesis, I think it's chapter 32, where Jacob wrestles with um, this mysterious figure who turns out to be Yahweh, we think. Um, and he's renamed Israel. And so just like Jacob was transformed into Israel and was given a new identity, this group of people that Yahweh just called the house of Jacob are about to be transformed into a new identity as Yahweh's special nation. And we're going to see in the next few verses, Yahweh's going to offer the people a choice. Will they enter into a covenant with him? And their choice is communal. He's addressing the whole body of people. They opt in or out together. It's not just like an individual thing. And in verse four, 
Yahweh starts off by reminding them of what he's done in the past, just like that song we sang. He wants them to remember he brought them out of Egypt. And he references what he did to the Egyptians. So I think that's referencing the signs and wonders, the plagues, the um, plague on the firstborn, the events of Passover, passing through the Red Sea. So remember what I did to the Egyptians, remember my signs and wonders, and um, I brought you to myself. And we're going to start to see that God in the past has been focusing on the knowledge of his name being made known through signs and wonders. And now we're moving into the space where Yahweh seems to be focusing on giving the people access to his presence. So then in verse five, it says, now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the people of Israel. So what is the choice? In verse 5, the choice is to obey Yahweh or not. And this phrase that's translated, this is the ESV, by the way, it's translated as indeed obey. In Hebrew, it's actually shema, shema, or just listen, listen. The word listen is repeated twice. To listen to Yahweh's voice is to obey. And if we think back to what Adam and Eve were supposed to do in the garden, right? They had access to God's presence. God was walking among them and they heard his voice. And they chose not to listen. They chose not to obey. And so Adam and Eve failed, but now humanity is represented by the people of Israel are given another shot. They're, they have a chance. They have a choice to obey Yahweh, to listen to his voice. They, it's like humanity is given, getting another shot at being God's true image bearers. And then Yahweh says, if you keep my covenant, the, the covenant is Yahweh's. Yahweh establishes the terms. This is not like a mutual agreement kind of a thing. This is all based on Yahweh's initiative. And he is going to dictate what the covenant includes. And so this is going to get spelled out through the Ten Commandments and through the Book of the Covenant later on. And I want us to keep in mind the covenant. So Yahweh introduces the covenant by saying, if you will listen to my voice. The covenant is primarily about obeying Yahweh's voice. It's not just a list of laws. He could have just given them a list of laws that they either obey or not. But he starts off by using these relational terms. If you'll listen to my voice. And so I want to pause here. I have in my notes bolded, very important note. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I want to point out that the call on the Israelites to obedience to Yahweh comes after they're already redeemed and saved out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And this is really crucial because their redemption, their salvation out of Egypt and through the Red Sea, out of slavery, is based on Yahweh's gracious initiative. Grace isn't like a thing that was invented in the, old, in the New Testament for the first time. This is, this is all about Yahweh's initiative. He chose to bring them out of Egypt and to make them his people before he called them to obedience in a specific way here. So the call to obedience is an invitation to them to live out their identity as the people that Yahweh's already redeemed. But... Their choice to obey Yahweh or not has very real implications on their access to Yahweh's presence and their relationship with Yahweh and their status as, as Yahweh's special people that are supposed to represent him to the nation. So I don't want to I don't want to cheapen this call to obedience. It has it has real implications. It's serious. Um, they become Yahweh's people because Yahweh chooses to redeem them not because they're so good at obeying the laws. But by obeying Yahweh's voice, by accepting the terms of this covenant that he's going to make with them, they're enabled to fulfill the role that Yahweh has planned for them. And this is a tension that we still feel as Yahweh's people through Jesus. We know that our redemption, our salvation is by faith, it's through grace, it's because of God's initiative towards us. But we're invited to live a life of obedience and response. It's our choice to obey or to disobey 
And this has implications to our access to God's presence and to our relationship with God. And also to how we live out our mandate to be God's people in the world. So let's keep that in mind as we um, go forward through Exodus and talk about all of these laws and all the tabernacle rules and all this stuff. It's easy to get bogged down, but even back in this time period before Jesus, it's still God's initiative to rescue his people. Um, it's not, they don't attain their status by um, how good they are at obeying, because we'll see that they're really bad <laughs> at obeying. So um, let's see. So then we see it here at the end of this section um, in verses five and six that there's these two phrases, you shall be my treasured possession and you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So if they obey, if they accept this relationship, this covenantal relationship with Yahweh, this is what their future is gonna look like. They're going to be Yahweh's treasured possession among all the peoples. And the word that's translated treasured possession is this Hebrew word, segula. I have no idea if I'm saying this right, but it sounds good. Um, it, it kind of has these connotations of like the king's treasure. So like imagine Solomon, all of Solomon's like jewels and precious metals. Um, it's not just a possession that you like put on a shelf and hide away and never think about it again. It's like a prized possession, like something that is like a great worth to a king. And there's a quote that I want to read from a Jewish scholar named S.R. Hirsch. He wrote a six volume commentary on the Pentateuch like a long time ago. <laughs> and he said about this word treasured possession, he says the use of this word for the fundamental condition which is demanded of us in our relationship to God indicates that we must become wholly and exclusively, sorry, completely and exclusively his possession in every phase of our being, that our whole existence and all our desires be dependent on him, that we give no place to aught but him to have any influence on the direction of our lives and actions. So by calling the people his treasured possession, Yahweh is inviting them to be completely his, to have him and his laws and his um, direction for how they're to live be the, the one thing that influences them. So this is like a total, a total belonging to God. And then Yahweh says there'll be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And so what is a kingdom of priests? It's even restored. It's what Adam and Eve were supposed to do at the beginning. They were supposed to be God's image bearers. They were supposed to rule on his behalf. And they were supposed to have priestly access to his presence in the garden. And this phrase, kingdom of priests, is interesting because we're going to see later that the Israelites have priests, but they're not all priests. So what happened with that? Did they like miss the mark? Were they all supposed to be priests? What's going on with that? So that's a question I'm not going to answer, but <laughs> you can think about that as we go forward in Exodus. So they are to be a kingdom of priests, a, a nation that bears God's image and has access to his presence. And then they're supposed to be a holy nation. So they're supposed to be radically different from the nations that are around them because Yahweh uniquely dwells with them. And we're going to see that um, a fifth of Exodus, most of the remaining chapters of Exodus are devoted to the descriptions of the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is the visible symbol that Yahweh dwells with his people. And it's kind of like a little mini Eden that they carry around with them. And so if we think back to Genesis 1 to 3, humans failed the test, right? They were expelled from Eden, expelled from God's presence. And now Israel as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation is a partial restoration of Eve. Israel in a way is gonna have the status of Adam and Eve before the fall. They're gonna rule over Yahweh's creation as kings and they're gonna have access to his presence as priests. But it's partial because access to Yahweh is still restricted, right? There's rules about who can go into the tabernacle and when they can go in and there's all these purification rules and we'll see all of this stuff that kind of shows that the access to Yahweh's presence is still limited because of, because of sin, because Yahweh is holy and the people are not. 
So we have a partial restoration of access to Yahweh. And the whole goal of biblical history, it seems like, is the restoration of this Eden-like existence for human beings, right? This involves the whole earth. Yahweh's desire is for everyone to be restored, to be his true image bearers and to have access to his presence, to have all the nations come back into his presence. So this is like the, the kind of like the beginning of that of that goal of all of the history. And so Moses passes on this invitation to the people. It's a big, it's a big deal. How will they respond? So the rest of chapter 19 um, tells us about what happens next. And I'm not going to read every word of the rest of the chapter, but we're going to kind of just go through it. Um, feel free to follow along in your Bibles if you want. Um, so in verse seven, it says, Moses came and he called the elders of the people and sat before them, oh, sorry, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all that Yahweh has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to Yahweh. So this is kind of like Yahweh just made a marriage proposal to the people, right? And then Moses is like, they said yes. <laughs> Um, and I, I just, I mean, I think they say all that Yahweh has spoken, we will do. And um, spoiler alert, they don't. <laughs> I mean, they just say that like so confidently, but they clearly, they, they, there's this sense that they want to be part of Yahweh's covenant. They're excited about this. And so then Yahweh tells Moses, have the people consecrate themselves, have them wash their clothes. And it says, be ready for the third day. So they're supposed to purify themselves for this three-day period. And then on the third day, Yahweh's going to come down onto the mountain, onto Mount Sinai, and it's going to get really intense. There's going to be thick clouds. There's going to be thunder. There's going to be, it says smoke like a kiln. And you can ask Alex what a kiln looks like, because I don't really know, but it sounds really hot and smoky. <laughs> and let's see, thunder and lightning. And, and all the people will see this, not just Moses. So, so far, Moses has really been the one that's been getting the firsthand interaction with Yahweh, right? And then he's like coming back to the people and telling them what Yahweh has said, what he's like. So they're all gonna see this dramatic descent of Yahweh onto the mountain. And it says they're supposed to mark a boundary around the mountain so that people don't accidentally touch the mountain before they're consecrated, right? And this is, this is serious business. If anyone crosses the boundary, Yahweh says that they're gonna die. So um, Yahweh's descent on the mountain is a really serious thing. And then in verse 13, it says, when the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. That's the ESV translation. It's interesting because the actual Hebrew preposition that's used there is come up onto the mountain. And most translations don't translate it literally. They, most translations say come up to the mountain. Um, I think it's the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, is the only one I found that actually keeps the literal translation. It says come up onto the mountain. Um, so either they're supposed to, on the third day, the trumpet's going to sound, they're supposed to either come up to the foot of the mountain or actually go up onto the mountain. Um, they're supposed to do something to approach Yahweh on that third day when the trumpet blasts. So Moses goes, he tells the people to consecrate themselves, and he assembles them at the foot of the mountain, and they're waiting for that trumpet blast on the third day. And I have, have you guys seen um, the Lord of the Rings movies? So in The Return of the King, Sam and Frodo are going up Mount Mordor, and there's like lava flowing, and it's like rumbling, and it looks really scary, and they're like pretty sure that they're going to die. <laughs> Um, they have they have this task. They have to. They know it's the right thing to do. They have to take the ring and throw it into the like lava river thing. But they're like pretty sure that they're going to die in the process, right? They're like not expecting to come back down off the mountain. And I think that's kind of like a good image for what's going on at Sinai here. The people don't know that Yahweh is not just going to like blast them with his holiness and they're all going to die. I mean, they're this is like scary stuff. Um, and there's all this thunder and smoke and fire and all kinds of loud noises and trumpets and yeah. So anyway, maybe this is what it looks like. I don't know. 
Um, it's really intense though. And so in verse 19, it says the sound of the trumpet is growing louder and louder and the, the, the mountain is billowing smoke and the people are like down at the bottom, like shaking and trembling. And it's the third day and the trumpet sounds and Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. And the people are all seeing this and hearing this. And then what do they do? Do they go up? Do they go up to the foot? Do they go up onto the mountain to meet with Yahweh? So then let's read verse 20. It says, Yahweh came down on Mount Sinai and Yahweh called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. So what happened to the people? What'd they do? What's going on here? <laughs> uh, so there's this question, were the people supposed to go up onto the mountain? Or were they just supposed to come up to the foot? They, it seems like Yahweh wanted them to see, all the people to see his presence and to hear his voice and not just to have it secondhand through Moses. So it's kind of a puzzle and most versions solve it by translating that preposition in verse 13 as come up to the mountain, like come up to the foot of the mountain. Because it seems like the people don't go up on the mountain. And so to me, this is not very satisfying. So, um, I want to go back to the chiastic structure. And so in the middle of the chiasm is chapter 20, verses 18 to 21. So I'm going to jump ahead and just read that now. This is what's at the kind of hidden in the center of the chiasm. And it's another test. It says, now, when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet, so it's on that third day, they're trembling at the foot of the mountain. They hear the trumpet. It's go time. They're supposed to approach the mountain. People were afraid and they trembled and they stood far off. And they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. We don't want to hear from God directly. We want you to go up and hear from God. And Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you and that you may not sin. People stood far off and Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. So they didn't want to die. They didn't want to go up the mountain. They stood far off instead. And so, I mean, I think if we accept that this piece of narrative in the middle of the chiasm is actually that moment back in chapter 19 where the trumpet sounds, I mean, it seems like it is, it uses the same language. Um, then what's going on? Moses says that this is a test. And in a lot of the Old Testament, we see this pattern of the third day as like a day of testing or a day when something big happens. Um, if we think about Abraham, when he's told to sacrifice Isaac in Genesis 22, it says he sees the mountain from far off on the third day. So that seems to have a lot of similarities to what's going on here. And does he stay far off? No, he obeys God and he goes up the mountain, even though it looks like he's walking into the death of his only son, the death of all his dreams. He walks up Mount Mordor, right? Because God told him to. So he passes the test, right? He obeys God, he listens to the voice of Yahweh. And so it, back to chapter 19, verse 11, the people are told to be ready for the third day, this climactic moment of decision. Are they going to pass the test? And it seems like they, they stand far off. They don't approach Yahweh. And so maybe they were, maybe they weren't ever supposed to go up on the mountain. And maybe the test was don't go near the boundary. I don't know. Um, but maybe the test was, are you going to like cower in fear? And, and because this mountain looks really scary and Yahweh's presence is really intense, or are you going to listen to the voice of Yahweh? and approach him and do what he says is good, even though it looks like you might die. So that's kind of like, that's kind of just like a little aside. I don't, I don't know, um, I don't know what the answer to this is, um, but you can kind of think about that if you want to and ponder. I think um, the structure of the chiasm in this section, chiasms point to what's in the middle. And so I think this is intended for us to read over and over and meditate on what were the Israelites supposed to do? And if we were in their place, what would we have done? And what does it mean to listen to Yahweh's voice and obey? So yeah, 
that's what happens. That's what we do when the covenant is introduced. So to kind of recap, Yahweh is inviting the people into a special relationship with him, right? They're supposed to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. They're supposed to be his special possession if they will listen to his voice. And they say yes to this. But then it kind of seems like they fail the test. They don't, they're scared. They don't, they're like, this is too much for us. We want the toned down version that comes through Moses. <laughs> and they're afraid to approach Yahweh. And we'll see as we go forward that they, they keep failing. They fail really dramatically with the golden calf incident that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so what will Yahweh do? His covenant with this people group, like we talked about, is his part of his plan to restore this Eden-like existence to humanity, um, to restore humans to be his image bearers and to have access to his presence. And can Yahweh's purposes be thwarted by human disobedience? Of course not, right? <laughs> Yahweh will ultimately accomplish his purposes and what he started in Israel through Jesus, and all nations will be invited to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And we see um, in the New Testament, the New Testament authors pick up this language of describing God's people as they talk about us as followers of Jesus. And so we're going to look at, um, oops, sorry, too far. I'm just going to read um, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. In this section, Peter is talking about how we should live as Christians, he says, verse nine, you are a chosen people, a royal, royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. I mean, this is just ripped straight out of Exodus 19. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness, called them out of Egypt into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And then the very next verse talks about living as foreigners and exiles and abstaining from sinful desires. So this is all about how should we act as the people of God. And we're invited into this um, status. If we will listen to the voice of Yahweh, we'll be his special possession, kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So we belong to God. We're called to be wholly his. And we're called to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We're called to be people who listen to the voice of Yahweh and obey. We're called to be distinct from the people around us because of our obedience. And we're called to have access to, we're called to approach Yahweh's presence through Jesus. And so like Israel, we have a choice. We have already been redeemed. Our salvation is because of God's initiative to us because of Jesus's righteousness on our behalf. But we're invited to live out our identity and to obey. And what does obedience look like in Exodus? It's listening to the voice of Yahweh. So I'm going to put this quote that I read earlier about what it means to be God's special possession. I'm going to leave this up on the screen. And I'd like to, there's not very many of these here this morning, so I think what I'd like to do is take a couple minutes just of silence, and I'd like for us to reflect for a little bit, what does it, what does it mean to completely belong to Yahweh as his special people? And is there an area of your life or a particular situation where God might be inviting you to listen to this voice and to obey? Or might there be a way that Yahweh is inviting you to um, walk towards the smoking mountain <laughs> deeper into his presence or follow him into something that looks like bad, badness for you, but might be what he's inviting you to do because he knows what's good. So, um, yeah, so let's reflect on that for a couple minutes. And then I'll kind of bring us back together in a few minutes, and then um, we'll maybe break off into little groups. And if you have something that comes to mind that you want to ask for prayer for um, relating to this stuff, you can, or you can um, just pray for each other's weeks. But um, let's have a few minutes of silence, and then I'll 
I'll bring us back together.